Would you like to accelerate your career and reach your full potential in just minutes a day? Welcome to the LeadX Show with New York Times bestselling author and Inc. 500 entrepreneur, Kevin Cruz. Imagine if you could discover how the world truly sees you. Welcome everyone, Kevin Cruz here, and in just a minute, we're going to talk about how you can capture an audience and influence behavior by becoming more of your true self. But first, don't forget to sign up for our newsletter at leadx.org because each super short issue has actionable tips to advance your career and to fulfill your potential. Visit leadx.org. I am excited for our guest today. She is brilliant and fun. She's an award-winning branding expert, a Hall of Fame speaker and author. She's the world's authority on the science of fascination based on her research of over 300,000 people. Her company developed the first methodology to actually measure your personal brand called Your Fascination Advantage. Her best-selling books include How the World Sees You and Fascinate, How to Make Your Brand Impossible to Resist. Our guest is Sally Hogshead. Welcome, Sally. Hey, Kevin. I am so happy to be talking to you today. Thanks for that great intro. Oh, yeah. We're going to have some fun, and we're going to talk about Fascinate in just a second, but I always like to start by asking our guests to share a time when you actually failed at something, maybe early in your career, because uh, I want to know, you know, what did you learn from it so we can all learn from, from that experience too. Can I share something that is related to failure, but it was a crushing experience that ultimately became my life's work. Sure. I was driving with my dad on a Sunday morning when I was in the fifth grade. I was 11 years old and we were going over a bridge and we were talking about what he loves about his work. And that's the last thing I remember before I woke up from a horrible car accident mm. that we had. A tow truck slammed into the door. Car was wrapped around a telephone pole. And when I came out of the surgery, I remember my mom feeding me and I could overhear the doctor talking talking about how they didn't know if I was going to be able to intellectually reclaim myself because uh, they didn't know how long I was without oxygen. I did come back on the inside, but the problem was all the nerves in my face had been severed and uh, I couldn't smile. And it, it, during that period of time, for about a year, I wasn't able to smile. And in a sense, that felt to me like I wasn't able to communicate. Mm. It shut me down. It was almost like my personality was sewn up along with all the scars. And it was out of that that I realized how much we need to be able to communicate. So when we're in a situation in which we feel as though we can't be authentic and we can't connect with people and we're not able to add value and express ourselves, it becomes like we're not able to smile. There were a couple of times in my life when I was really struggling during the recession in 2008, when my first book came out and it didn't do as well as I mm. wanted to, it felt the same way. So that sense of failure, whether it's actually a failure or it becomes something that feels like it's a block to you being who you actually are. It's sometimes the scars can run deep and it affects us our whole life. And that becomes our life's work to be able to overcome that. And for me, it became about studying fascination and how we are most likely to be able to connect and communicate and impress and influence and build relationships with the people around. Wow. Such a powerful story. And and, you know, it reminds me, well, LeadX listeners, sometimes I'll talk about kind of thinking about or uncovering your own zero to hero story. Mm. And, you know, whatever your life's work is, whatever you're passionate about in, in your career, some, sometimes you might not really realize, like, how did I end up in this, you know, career? How did I end up in this position? And I think it's good to really anchor it in, in that why. And, and Sally, thanks for sharing that. Yes, thank you. So, Sally, your book that I want to talk about is Fascinate, How to Make Your Brand Impossible to Ignore. And I got to warn you, Sally, my friends who know me well, my nickname is called Veiled Strength. So if you're picking up on a vibe, it's going to be the Veiled Strength vibe. <laughs> <laughs> can we describe that for a minute? Can we please Kevin? Are you okay? Can I ask you a couple of questions? Yeah, we could just riff in whatever way you want to go with yeah. this. Yeah. <laughs> okay. When you took the fascination advantage assessment, you learned that there are two different ways that you are most likely to be seen at your best. And the first way is that you're a great listener. That's called the mystique advantage. The second way is that you have power, meaning you lead with confidence. So the archetype that you have, meaning how your personal brand is seen at its best, is 
the veiled strength. And here's what that means. I want you to think of a world championship poker player who's sitting at the table, who's not going to give away all the clues, who's going to listen and watch and see the tells of the people around him. You know what I mean when I say a tell? Yes, yes, right. Right? So watching those tells and then playing very strategically to think two steps ahead. That's what we learned when you took the fascination advantage assessment. The three adjectives that describe you are realistic, intentional, and to the point. (laughs) When you think about who you are at your best, in other words, when people are most impressed by how you're adding value, which one of those three best describes it? Realistic, intentional, or to the point? Well, it's funny because all three of those, I think, fit very well. And I think people would would say that. Um, I think I'm going to go with to the point. And let me also say that as I admit that probably to the point, I cringe a little bit because, you know, being all warm and fuzzy and all that kind of stuff, that's definitely not my strength. So I feel like I'm admitting that maybe I'm almost too much to the point, but that's probably it. Well, let's describe this for a moment. Imagine that you're going into one of those situations when you want to play your A game. What would be a situation like that, Kevin? Like say you're stepping on to a big podcast like this, all right. Can I give you a real one? I like, I want free coaching here. Yeah. Okay. So without saying the name, I have a book offer from one of the big publishers in New York and it's all great. However, <laughs> I'm going to, in about two weeks, I'm going to go to New York, sit down face to face with the editor and I'm going to undo the deal that we have with the proposal because I have an even better idea for a book and I could What's at risk is he might say, you're all over the place. You don't, you no longer want to do the book that I just bought. So get out of here and the contract's done. Or if I win, we're literally creating a brand new book and it's going to be bigger than the last one. So this is a very high stakes meeting that I'm going to go into. So coach me on how I might uh, lead with strengths here. Sure. Now, remember, when uh, when you took the assessment, your result was the veiled strength. And what we just identified is the way in which you are most likely to add value in that meeting to be seen at the top of your game is to the point. That's the, the descriptive phrase. That's how you're different. So, Kevin, when you go into this meeting, here's how I want you to think about this. The doors are about to open or you're going up in the elevator. And when you walk in, you don't have to create a lot of drama You don't have to add a lot of fluff. You want to sit down and say, I have an idea that I want to share with you. It's a pivot from where we were before. Before, what we were looking at was, and then give three bullet points. Mm -hmm. Now, what I'm proposing is that we do, and then you list the three bullet points and show it as a trajectory. In other words, you're building upon what you already did before. Got it. I would have a very different approach. When I take the fascination advantage, which um, although I created it, I have done it, (laughs) I fascinate very differently than you. In other words, I add value differently. And whereas you are the veiled strength so that you don't communicate with a lot of emotion, you are not chaotic, you're not unorthodox and necessarily the way that you communicate. My archetype is the catalyst. The three ways the catalyst is most likely to differentiate themselves is by being out of the box, social, and energizing. These are the three adjectives that describe my personal brand. When I went into that meeting, let's say I'm I'm going up in the elevator and the elevator dings and the doors open and I walk into the meeting, the way I would be most likely to add value to the meeting is by saying, I am so excited to see you today. And I love the original book concept that we did, but I've been thinking about it and I think I've evolved it we could do something slightly different that I think would be even more effective. Let me tell you a story about it. And then I would give them adjectives, descriptors. I would make them feel something. So the way I'm most likely to add value is by having my listener experience an emotion. You, on the other hand, would be to the point. So Sally, this is really interesting to me. And it, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm laughing and taking notes at, you know, your fascination advantage versus mine. We had a very nice um, pre-interview chat and it must be because opposites attract or something. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yes. And so there's a part of me that would say, you know what? I wish you were going in to meet this editor instead of me, because I feel like energy is persuasive and we persuade with energy and emotion and emotion is contagious and all of this. And is it that, well, maybe there is 
a better way to approach certain situations. But Kevin, you can't fake it. Like that's just going to come off as not you. So you have to understand who you are. Your best odds is just to be yourself and lead with your strengths. Is that how I should approach this? Yes. And let me give you a specific example. Um, We've measured now, we've measured a million professionals inside of Twitter and Porsche and GE and AT&T. Yeah, it's it's growing exponentially. And um, I did a study of the high performers. What are the people who are at the top of their game? What do they do differently? And there were two things they did differently in their performance. The first thing they did was they delivered a specific benefit. So they weren't trying to be all things to all people. They were not trying to be pretty good in a lot of areas. They essentially identified, here's how I'm most likely to add value. Here's how I can distinguish myself. And then they totally honed in and doubled down on that benefit. The people who were good at details were really good at details. They made a point to attract assignments, clients, customers, co-workers who needed detail orientation. They delivered the spreadsheets. They gave the in-depth analytics. They did not worry about being the cheerleader, Mm -hmm. the visionary, the brainstormer, because that, for them, that was almost like a disadvantage. The second thing that high performers do differently is they have a specialty and they're associated with this specialty. So people come to them, their ideal client seeks them out and comes to them for this specialty. If I were to go into a meeting, say that a game meeting that we just described, you and I, if I went in and tried to be realistic, intentional, and to the point like you, not only would it be stifling, but I would be unauthentic. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be adding value in the way in which my, my personal brand is primed. You, on the other hand, if we said, hey, Kevin... You're energetic, but go into this meeting and we want you to be out of the box and social and it that would feel hyper for you. It would be and it would let's be honest, it would kind of be exhausting for you, wouldn't it? Oh, it would be very exhausting for me, Sally. (laughs) Yeah. And and so if I may, let me continue on and ask another question. Say I'm a say I'm a client working with you, and I said, Kevin, I want you to write me an article and it's gonna be flowery. And uh, I want you to be super effusive in this writing. That would probably feel like an assignment that is setting you up for failure, wouldn't yeah, you think? Yeah, I, I would be horrible at that. Yeah, but if I said, listen, Kevin, um, high profile magazine, um, like say, for example, Forbes, and uh, we want you to just give killer content, hone it down, give us bullet points. I'm your man. You're the man because we just described the way in which you're most likely to differentiate is by being to the point. And so here's the thing. People add value in specific ways. The problem is that within workplace culture, too often we're focused on trying to fix ourselves. We focus on our weaknesses. I don't believe in strengths versus weaknesses. In my studies, I'm not measuring how do you see the world? I'm measuring how does the world see you? Mm. In other words, unlike Myers-Briggs or DISC or StrengthsFinder, which are all gold standard assessments, those are built on psychology. So um, those are measuring how do you see the world? Instead, I built my assessment on branding and I created the algorithm exactly the way I did with world-class brands in focus groups. Think about it, like Minnie Cooper, one of my former clients. Minnie Cooper doesn't care about how Minnie sees the world. Minnie only cares about <laughs> how does the world see Minnie? How does the right. consumer see Minnie? So uh, f- for, for anybody, if you understand how other people see you at your best, it becomes so much easier. And frankly, it's a relief to think, okay, Kevin, you don't need to be um, out-of-the-box social and energizing. And it's a relief for me to know I don't have to be realistic, intentional, and to the point. It's not that we can't. It's right. just not it's, – it's not going to be our wellspring. No, th- that makes a lot of sense. And you're talking about um, – you know, when, when we, we're saying – giving, for example, um, my advantage, that, that name, The Veiled Strength. Now, this comes from your assessment, which we'll talk a little bit more about, but it's based on these seven fascination triggers. And, you know, it's a short format show. We can't go deep into them, but can you highlight them, like uh, what the seven triggers are for people? Sure. I started as a creative director, which is coming up with the big concept ideas for television commercials for brands like Nike and Target and Coca-Cola. And what I found was there's a shortcut to coming up with a brand. If you can identify which one of these seven categories a brand message falls into, it becomes a lot easier for you to create the marketing message. 
the seven different advantages include innovation, which is a brand that communicates with creativity, passion, which is a brand that communicates with emotion, power and prestige and trust, mystique and alert. Once you can categorize where your brand message should be, then you can kind of specialize exactly like the high performers I was talking about. In 2010, I began studying, well, how did people fascinate? In other words, how are people likely to be seen at their best, just like a world-class brand? And I found that people use the same seven advantages. Mm -hmm. They're hardwired neurologically. And uh, so that's when I created the algorithm. And that became a new way for people to be able to see themselves, not based on strengths versus weaknesses, but instead based on differences. What makes you different? How do you differentiate yourself so that you can make a difference? Yeah, this is great. And so to make it even more practical, you talked about, um, you know, all these high performers in different companies. Let's say, you know, I'm a high potential in a, I don't know, some big Fortune 500 company. And I now have identified my, you know, fascination advantage, whether it's the veiled strength or the mastermind or, or one of these others. How can I apply that? You mentioned personal branding. So how would I proactively, you know, remember what this is and use it to my advantage? That's an excellent question because a lot of times we think of entrepreneurs as having carte blanche to build a personal brand from the ground up, whereas if you're working in a Fortune 500 company like you mentioned. So let's take one of my clients, GE. Say somebody starting as a project manager in an administrative position. You would think that you have to follow a certain model. There are specific ways in the employee manual that a project manager should operate. But imagine this instead. If somebody comes in and they're intensely creative, we'll call her Beth. Beth comes in and she can take a look at a project and see, well, we have a limited budget or we're in a crunch for time or we don't have a big team working on this, Beth would be able to be really creative about finding untraditional solutions. On the other hand, let's imagine that we have somebody completely different coming in who uses different advantages. We'll call him Joe. And Joe comes in and he's methodical, he's analytical, he's strategic, he's pragmatic. He wouldn't solve problems in the same way as Beth. He would come in and say, let's look at the data. What's the background? What's the research we have? And how do we replicate in the past what we already did well? These are two totally different ways of executing the same job description. But Beth and Joe are going to be most fulfilled and higher performing if they can stick in their lane. In other words, find their specialty, hone in on that, double down on that, and deliver a specific benefit. Love it. Love that. So I always like to end on high value. People are, you know, learning about all of this, but I want them to anchor some of these findings. I want them to take action. What's something specific that our audience members can do today? A key thing is for you to understand how does the world see you at your best? Remembering, you can't be all things to all people. How do people see you as being different? Is it because you're like Beth, where you're creative? Are you like Joe, who's analytical? Once you understand how people see you at your best, you can be different. And here's the key, Kevin. In a crowded, competitive, commoditized, distracted world, it's good to be better but it's better to be different. Mm. Different is better than better. So the question is, how are you different? I'm taking notes on all of this. <laughs> this is great stuff. So Sally, what's the best way our listeners can find out more about you, your company, and the Fascinate Advantage? Well, you and I have a little surprise for people. <laughs> we have a version of the assessment that they can take the assessment themselves, just like you did. And here's how they can do it. They go to howtofascinate.com forward slash you, Y-O-U. And um, <laughs> I'm frequently told that fascinate is not the easiest word to spell, so I'll spell it. It's how to fascinate F-A-S-C-I-N-A-T-E dot com forward slash you. When they first arrive, when they come, they'll be asked if they have a code. And if you have a code, you can take it for free. And the code is, cleverly enough, lead X. Love it. All one word, not case sensitive, lead X. They'll answer 28 questions. It's three minutes. And they'll get their result calculated from our results with a million professionals. Sally, first of all, big thanks. And listeners, no bull here. Like I'm looking at my report that, that I took. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. It's multi-page. There's these great, like you have to do this thing. This is a very high value assessment. So thanks Sally for offering that up. 
Sally, thanks for coming on the show. I can't wait for our listeners to take this assessment. And in fact, listeners, when you take it, email me at kevin at leadx.org and tell me how are you leading? What did your report say? How are you different? Because I would love to know. I would love to engage on this idea. So Sally, thanks again for the time today. You know, I'm a longtime fan, follower. I love seeing everything you do. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, our pleasure. Friends, you've just been mentored by personal branding expert Sally Hogshead. You can get links and show notes from this interview, of course, over at leadx.org. One more thing. If you've ever got one new idea from LeadX Show, please, please, please just leave a short, honest review up on iTunes. And until next time, remember, leadership isn't about your title or power or authority. It's all about influence. We are all leaders. Who are you going to lead today? Today.